So welcome everyone. We're just letting everyone into the webinar and then we'll make a start. So numbers seem to have settled, so um, we will make a start. Um, we'll see if others join. Uh, welcome today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jason Reeves. I'm SIMES Head of Policy. I'll be the host today. Uh, this is the ninth episode of our Sector Streams webinar series. Uh, and today our topic is economics and the environment. Um, Sector Streams is our monthly topical webinar series. Uh, previous episodes are on our YouTube channel and in the resource hub on the SIEM website. They're freely available, so you can find them there. And we're recording this episode, so this will be added to those as a resource. So today we're talking about economics and the environment, uh, something I think that uh, in the ecology and environmental management sector we don't talk enough about. So today should hopefully be an interesting discussion. Um, we'll have a panel discussion, then we'll have a Q&A with the audience. So if you do have any questions as we go through today, please do use the Q&A function and pop them in there and we'll go through those towards the end. Um, and then introducing today's panel. So a really great panel today. We've got Catherine Farrell, uh, Karen Ellis and Roger Crofts. Uh, and I'll just ask them each to briefly introduce themselves. Can we start with Catherine, please? Yes, hi everybody. Um, and it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so to introduce myself, I'm an ecologist that has been really working on restoration and rehabilitation of degraded peatlands for most of my career. I worked with the Irish Peat Company in Ireland uh, to map out their land holding up about 80,000 hectares and worked for many years trying to convey the value of these really uh, degraded sites, but equally the margins that were of high value to convey the value to the financial operators and to explain why we needed to restore and all those really interesting things that as ecologists you sort of understand the value of, the inherent value of, but I found it quite difficult to convey that to the more financial sort of economic side of the house. Um, I've also worked as a consultant on strategic infrastructure projects and I've stayed connected with the ecological network through SAIEM. Also, uh, I'm a founding member of Natural Capital Ireland, member of the Community Wetlands Forum, the Society of Ecological Restoration. So I see all those components been really important to integrate thinking about what I'm doing now. So for the past two and a half years, I've been working on developing the process steps to apply natural capital or ecosystem accounting uh, at a catchment scale in Ireland. Um, we are way behind what you have been doing in the UK, uh, but we're really learning uh, a lot from the valuable lessons that you've, um, and, the, and the literature that you've published. And I hope to publish quite a lot in the next six months or so that we can add to that conversation um, delighted to be part of this group and really excited to hear what Roger and Karen have to say. Um, so a uh, very much a learning process for me this morning. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, Karen. Thanks very much and good morning. Uh, so I'm Karen Ellis, the Director of Sustainable Economy at WWF UK, uh, where we have a, um, work streams on sustainable economic policy, sustainable finance and sustainable development. Um, and we are really uh, looking at how you can uh, transform the economic and financial system for sustainability. Really. Um, by background, I am an economist and I, I actually started my career, I've been on a bit of a journey. I started my career uh, working in consultancy for the private sector on economic regulation. Uh, then I worked at the treasury for a while on uh, macroeconomics, trade, uh, capital, international capital markets and things like that fiscal and macroeconomic policy. And I worked in development, uh, international development policy, working for Department for International Development and then Overseas Development Institute. And only eight years ago, moved into environmental issues, working for WWF. And 
in that time, in the last eight years, I think there's been a massive change in the way the environment movement uh, engages on economics and finance. Because when I first joined WWF, I remember I felt so I spoke a completely different language to the people I was now working with. And it was an extremely interesting journey for us all in terms of navigating that gap. And I think now there's a lot more understanding in WWF and, and across the whole conservation movement, I would say, on the sort of economics and finance of this issue and how that's really, I think, one of the biggest barriers to achieving sustainability and that, you know the fact that the economic system hasn't facilitated that that transition so now that, that increasing engagement on these issues I think is absolutely crucial and and really make starting to make a big difference so um yeah really keen to talk about this whole topic uh, today so, yeah, thank you that's great thanks Aaron and Roger thanks very much good afternoon everyone I started life as a geographer uh, did research on geomorphology and got particularly interested in well how you use scientific knowledge to influence management and make better decisions uh, gave up the academic world went to work in the civil service largely on economic development uh, uh, and surrounded by economists who were trying to give us advice uh, often which i didn't like at all because i didn't think it fitted into the policy that our government wanted to do at the time uh, and then went back to my old roots uh, by a change of job in the ministry, which ultimately led to becoming uh, the founder chief executive of Scottish Natural Heritage, now called Nature Scots, which I did for a decade. And since then, I've been enjoying myself in all sorts of ways, working in Saeem. I'm now a patron. Uh, I've worked in uh, with IUCN, particularly on protected areas and more recently on geoconservation. I suppose my mission fits in with this topic because I really want to uh, make everybody understand how important the environment is uh, to everyone, to every business, every person, every different specialism. And it takes me back to the debates we had in the 90s and when we were talking about natural capital. And I had the good sense to, to go back and read the guy who invented the whole concept of ecosystem, Arthur Tansley, way back in the 1930s. And we've got all of these big picture views of things. And I do get very frustrated when some of my uh, dear colleagues uh, are inevitably so focused on the minutiae, which are important, the species and habitats, but it's, it's important for most of us uh, to open our eyes, take the blinkers off and say, hey, wait a minute, we need to engage with these um, people who are, are making money, they're capitalists, you know, because they're not all bad and they are beginning to listen. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. So that's my stance, thanks. Thanks very much, Roger. Um, so we'll move into some questions now and some discussion points for the panel. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, pop them in the Q&A function, um, but we'll, we'll start a discussion. Um, Karen, can I start with you on a sort of really big picture question on, um, do you think ecologists and nature conservationists and environmentalists are bad at engaging with uh, economics? I mean, I'm, I suppose I'm thinking of the Dasgupta review uh, coming out from an economist from Treasury, and yet ecologists have been talking about this for 30, 40 years at least. Yeah, I, I do think that has been the case for sure. There's been, as I mentioned just now, a, a big gap, I would say, in the both the mindset and the language used by these different groups of, of people. Um, uh, but that has changed, I think, over, over recent years uh, to a large extent. But I, I felt as though there definitely has, as you say, been a lot of um, work on the sort of environmental economic side and, and natural capital and those concepts have been around for a while, a long time. But maybe what was lacking was um, a link to the sort of macroeconomic space, the sort of um, the treasury sort of space. What does this mean in terms of macroeconomic policy making, fiscal policies and, and uh, how we regulate the financial sector? You know, these were quite... Uh, you couldn't easily use the sort of natural capital approaches that have been developed in those macroeconomic contexts. So it feels like there's a, been a big job to do to 
uh, convert that understanding of nature and how we are all dependent on nature for our whole economy, let's face it, everything we do, everything we eat, everything we use based on nature. Um, converting that into an understanding that fits into economic models and ways of thinking has been difficult. And that's what the Das Gupta Review did do really well, I think, and, and, and really did it in the language of economists as well and economic policy makers, which, so to some extent, I suspect a lot of people who've been working in this field of environmental economics or ecologists, you know, probably didn't think there was that much that was new in the Das Gupta Review, but the way it was put and the way it was described in the economics language, I think was probably, did feel quite new to the mainstream economist audience. Mm -hmm. So I think that was really important. And now it's given us a lot of entry points, you know, for discussing how do we now operationalize this? I think there's still a long way to go actually in operationalizing it. Um, and this whole growing idea of needing to create a nature positive economy. What the hell does that mean? How do we get there? Lots of work still to be done, but at least now we've got the, the basics clearly set out by Das Gupta and kind of agreed, I guess, now by, at least by the UK government. And hopefully there'll be sort of wider adoption globally as well of that kind of concept and, and that uh, framing. Um, so now we can sort of take steps off, off the back of that to work out how we actually address the issues that the Das Gupta Review raised. Thanks. Uh, Roger, does that fit with your uh, getting ecologists and environmental managers to look at the big picture a bit more rather than the, the minutiae and the details as you were saying? Yeah, yes it does. Uh, but I mean the thing that strikes me most of all is this lack of common language. Um, you know the professions are getting more and more complex and if ever you move into a new subject, I mean I've been dabbling as I said in geoconservation and it's it's horrific what the language of the geologists, you know, um, and they wonder why they can't communicate. And it's the same with the macroeconomists. Um, my greatest mentor was a macroeconomist, and sometimes I had to say, "I don't know what you're talking about." Uh, so it's it's important that we begin to share language that is that is uh, common to us all. I think that's quite fundamental. I also think that. Uh, we should, as ecologists and environmental managers, uh, be thinking how we can fix uh, these new ways of thinking. You know, we still haven't got the alternatives to uh, GDP, and it's still trotted out as the indicator of performance of, of, of nations. And there's been lots of talk about wellness measures, societal benefits, uh, in business, we've had triple bottom line, we've had corporate social responsibilities. But I think we still need to think quite hard and, and help economists uh, uh, and the, the business profession say how we can look at things in the round and how we can measure them. Do, we've almost forgotten that we had a, a millennium ecosystem assessment, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, but that was a wonderful foundation for being able to uh, put the whole of the ecosystem right in the heart of decision-making and put it into uh, accounting system. So it's in the national accounts, for instance. We've been arguing it for years. We've just got to keep battering away. But as Karen says, we've out now got many more open doors to walk through, providing we all begin to speak the same language. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Catherine, just I don't know if you want to add anything. I suppose I'm curious to know if the Dusk Gupta reviews have the same kind of profile in Ireland. I'm not. I yes, yes, it has, and I think um, we we certainly promoted it through our networks, and I know it was picked up by the NGOs as well. So it, it definitely crossed the water. Um, I think to add to what Karen and Roger have said. The key thing is the language. I mean, so at the outset, when I was introducing myself, I outlined the different networks and groups I'm part of. And within all of those networks, we, there's a different parlance, there's a different style, there's a different approach in doing that. And I was laughing when Roger was talking about the geologists, because as part of our project, we were engaging with the geologists and we're building a geosystem account piece uh, and that was just a real 
learning curve for me because you know the terminology the way of viewing the world and it it actually you know while learning a lot it 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 explained a lot about that approach of looking at the world and then you know you go to an economist and you see their approach to looking at the world is completely different so this is why we haven't been able to communicate because we've been looking through different lenses and through different glasses, essentially. So from the, the common language is really important. And I suppose the language of economists doesn't fit quite well with the language of ecologists. And often that's the main turning off point for ecologists. It's, you know, because natural capital accounting and ecosystem accounting and national accounts it, it embeds that valuation that it, it infers monetization all the time. And that's the immediate turnoff for ecologists because how can you put a monetary value on this uh, nature? So uh, the, the common language is really important. And the, the nub of it really is we're bad with engaging with economists because we aren't economists. You know, we just aren't. So. And equally, just as economists, and I've been quite hardened as to how economists, I'm speaking about them like they're a different species, but <laughs> how economists have embraced ecological thinking and statisticians like working with the guys in the UN on the system of environmental and economic accounting. So they have an open door and, and it's up to us to walk up and say, look, there's a lot of complexity around nature and Georgina Mace was excellent. She always reiterated that through all of her publications, but we still have to talk together. And if ecologists aren't there, we've totally missed the boat because, you know, these uh, crises that we talk about, climate and biodiversity, they're not ours to own. You know, you know we can sort of, you know, try and share the message, but it's up to everyone to play the part. So it's working together, you know, groups like the World Economic Forum recognize that the biodiversity crisis is the greatest threat to economic, um, you know, activity, all these sorts of things. So it's about trying to break down the silos. And I learned that through with my ge geology colleagues who were trying to break out of their silo. You know, and, and they were taking those baby steps and fumbling over concepts and we just had to take time. But when you do take the time, the re rewards are really there for people and planet. So I think that's um, my interpretation. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Roger, do you think ecologists need to be a bit braver in jumping into that world, uh, being a bit more forthright? Yes, but I can understand why we've been reticent, if you like, because what we're seeing, particularly in our profession through the Chartered Institute, many, most of our members are, are doing habitat service in, in the, and, and species service is in the face of a development challenge, a road project, renewable energy or whatever. And that's inevitably going to be their focus. And... I can entirely understand their position. I do sometimes struggle about putting monetary values on everything uh, because actually we're talking about the non-quantifiable quite often here because it's emotional, it's qualitative. And I think we could spend a lot more time explaining the qualitative values. I mean, what's the sea change thing for me is I, I remember giving a talk about 15 years ago uh, saying don't go to the GP surgery go out and take your your outdoor pill and everybody thought I'd gone a bit daft uh, but you know now all of that has come to the forefront and even epidemiologists and mainstream you know techie medics have come on on that line and I think one way for us to preach this is, is to actually talk up nature. I'm, a, I, I'm very keen on, on nature as opposed to ecology or geomorphology or, or the components of it. It's the whole thing of which humans are part of. But one other thing, um, if, I, if I go back 
to the days when we were arguing all the time with large landowners about the value of their land, they had a totally different view. It was all about, if you like, the sporting take. And you see this in you know, the North Pennines, you see it in the Scottish Highlands, for instance, about the number of salmon, the number of grouse bags. Whereas there's a totally different way of doing it, and that's how the, the scene has changed, you know, and Karen's absolutely right to point that out. People are now buying estates, certainly in the Highlands of Scotland, uh, because they can get some benefits from carbon. They're buying it for the carbon sequestration potential, if you like. My gosh, that's a sea change, isn't it? As opposed to arguing about raptors or a nuisance uh, uh, and you know, we should get rid of them because they're eating the, the young grouse. Um, and therefore, if we can change the conversation about how we value resources, uh, not just the financial ones, I would say, but put it in a different context, then I think that would help. Thanks. Karen, you're sort of at the interface with, as an economist in, an, in a nature conservation organisation. Have you seen that? change with WF being more outspoken and others as well? Yes, definitely engaging more on this agenda. Um, I, I, in terms of your question, do they need to be braver? I think yes and no. In some ways, I feel as though eco ecologists or environmentalists anyway have been quite brave and talking about things like the need for degrowth um, or, um, you know, talking about systems change the problem with it has been that it's often sort of wrapped up in anti-capitalist rhetoric and both degrowth and anti-capitalist rhetoric are not going to get anywhere with in the current political context and most mainstream economists are also not open to those kinds of ideas being uh, likely to fly so i think in some ways what we need to do is get more pragmatic about where to start from where we are now and work out how to transform as quickly as possible to the system. We do need system change, but how do we get there as quickly as possible from where we are now without having to overthrow capitalism? Because I think we'll be waiting a long time potentially to do that. So, um, so I think talking about systems change is important, but how we define that. Um, and I think it's about changing the rules of the game so that it, it rewards sustainable decision making always and everywhere across the board rather than penalizing it effectively which is what the current system does the market system currently penalizes sustainable decision making to a large extent so we've got to shift the rules of the game through policy and regulation largely um, to reward sustainability across the private sector and that does that probably will involve quite significant changes um, you know i talk about repurposing the economy. So that's like redefining uh, growth. I would say not degrowth, but redefining growth around, um, uh, as Das Gupta talks about, inclusive wealth, which is actually a measure of the assets which underpin our future prosperity, including natural capital, but not only natural capital. So redefining growth, so repurpose the economy, repurpose business. So it's not just about ma maximizing profits, but it's about delivering benefit to society and having it more accountable or it's both environmental and social impacts. And so having re um, reporting processes in place that facilitate that. And also repurposing the finance sector. So it's financing the right kinds of businesses and economic activities, which again requires significant sort of regulatory changes. Because at the moment, the whole system is about protecting the shareholders, protecting the bottom line. It's the fiduciary duty of you know, boards to ensure that companies are doing the things that will benefit the profit. Uh, the, the, the shareholders rather than stakeholders, wider societal stakeholders. So it is significant changes we need, um, but we can do that without overthrowing capitalism. Um, and so it's working out how do we get to there, there you know, from where we are now. Catherine, did you want to add anything to that one? Yeah, I think, you know, that is so true because we often uh, hear the phrase we need to change the system and we need to overthrow the system and it's not working and um, it just has to be repurposed we have to build on what we have we don't have the time for a sudden enlightenment uh, across uh, communities to value things in different ways and 
uh, back to your question where you know should ecologists be more assertive and and getting braver and having these discussions i think they are truly and i have to say from the irish perspective uh, the first natural capital ireland meeting that we held in 2014 was led by a group of ecologists and attended by over 120 ecologists and there was one banker guy who we knew who was sort of interested in carbon uh, trading and carbon stocks and then there was one ceo and that's the ceo of the company i worked for at the time because i persuaded him to come along so it was very much led by ecologists here but in terms of the frameworks and the natural capital accounting framework and just this last few weeks i've been doing some training um, on the economic valuation side of things and trying to understand that and what always struck me is that, you know, economists have always been in the position to influence decision making. But ecologists were never, we're always sort of like dangling out in the far corner, out on the bog, you know, getting emotional and getting excited about things and, but not really involved in the decision making. I'm speak, speaking from my, my own perspective. Um, and so that's because the economy was viewed as one of the, the only thing that matters perhaps. But, you know, we touched on it already, indicators like GDP, those are the things that measure apparently how well we're doing, but there have been calls since the 1990s to get rid of it. And we might talk a bit later about some of the ways that people are doing that. But Roger made the point clearly, we need to talk up nature. And we need to talk about the full array of values. As a, as a colleague in uh, the UN Stats Division reminded me, the reason there's a valuation in there, in this system of environmental economic accounting, is because it's developed largely by economists. You know, so we shouldn't really be surprised when we're presented with these frameworks. But that to me is, we need to, you know, don't assume the economists get it. Don't assume that they know everything we know, because they don't. And, and, and equally, as we don't know what, what they know and the expertise that they bring. So that's the reason that the monetary approach is there. But there's a whole other way of value, you know, the qualitative piece. And, and really, in so many ways, you know, it's all ultimately about human well-being, even though sometimes we squirrel it away at the bottom corner of the cultural services that, you know, that's, that's a piece that's always stuck on at the end almost. But that needs to be brought front and service or front and center to this whole discussion that the valuations, the, that emotional piece is important. You know, it's part of being human. It's part of our relationship. And unless we have a relationship, an understandable relationship with nature, we won't value it. So all those things Karen talked about, you know, the bottom line, and that's the main driver. And we need to have X amount of profit and blah, blah, blah. Unless we start to bring those other values in, we're, we're really going to stick in that mode. So it's up to us to talk up, literally to talk up nature. And there's a, there's a great example in Ireland where, you know, they want, there's this mountain called Crow Patrick and there's gold in the mountain. It's out on the West Coast. And there was this mining company coming in and they were starting to value the, the gold and the provision of the grazing and, all that sort of stuff but ultimately it was trumped because it was a holy mountain it was deeply embedded in the psyche of the irish people for millennia so there you go evaluation it's not just about the money and it's our role i think to bring that forward thank you i think that's great just just holding on to that point for a second i think i'm curious as to where the balance is then between the sort of intrinsic value that Roger talked about and where the market mechanism sits. So Roger talked about carbon credits. Um, we've got payments for ecosystem services. We've got natural capital accounting. Um, where do those um, market mechanisms sit then in the balance? How, how, where do we go with those? And if Catherine, you wanted to take that one first. Yeah, I think there, it's it's back to making small changes you know working with the systems that we have you know that 
you know, we, we, we develop these tools like natural capital accounting, we develop the, the payments for ecosystem service, and they are tools that we can use to start changing and driving behaviors and of people led by payments, you know, or, or pushed on by payments, however you want to look at it, that we, we do need those. So we can't just throw out the established ways. We've got to work with those that set us back on track. Um, so, you know, I think over time, uh, and perhaps with a more radical generation um, and, and maybe even wiser building on the shoulders of the great work by Roger and Karen and all these new tools that are coming through, we might have better systems, but the payments for ecosystem services, they, they, they fit well with those mechanisms, but it, and they can be used to, to drive the changes as we need immediately. So I, there's definitely a role uh, for those. Thanks. Karen, does that sit with you as to where the, you talked about those incremental changes rather than overthrowing capitalism to those kind of market mechanisms do they meet the goals that you're, you're thinking about and, and looking at to make those changes and get us down that path in the right direction? Yeah, so I think they are definitely needed and we need to continue to develop those approaches. But I do think we also need, we do still need something a bit more radical than that to drive change faster. And so I think as both um, Catherine and Roger have alluded to, the challenge has been that mostly the economy still always trumps environmental considerations. So you know, usually it's actually explicitly in the, the regulation, like the local councils have to consider when they're doing a new development, they have to consider uh, the impact on the environment where possible, you know, or, or where it doesn't undermine our economic objectives. But that is literally added onto the end of the sentence. So we've got to turn that on its head. So we're saying, actually, we've got a, a sort of macroeconomic goal, which is to get to this nature positive economy. Now there is recognition of the need for a nature positive economy from the G7, from the UK government, from a growing number of countries around the world, the leaders pledge for nature. We need a nature positive economy. So globally we are restoring nature because we know now we've got, we're facing significant economic and social costs from loss of nature. So we need to create a nature positive economy that helps us restore nature. We need to set that goal and then work out how we get there. You know, how can we get the economy and the financial system to deliver that for us. So instead of making the environment subservient to the economy, we're making the economy subservient to environmental goals and other goals. You know, it should be delivering what society wants it to deliver rather than a slave to the economic profits. You know, so um, I think that we do need that and we are getting there actually. There's a lot of agreement and discussion of this whole idea of a nature positive uh, economy. Still a lot more, as I said before, needs to be done to work out how we get to that. But I think in some ways we can learn from what's happening on net zero, because net zero has taken off as a concept. Um, we've got it in law, we're getting it. Loads of plans are coming out from the private sector, how they are gonna align with net zero. The government last week published its net zero strategy, setting out a wider economic plan for getting to net zero. We need all of that on nature positive as well um, to set out how we're gonna get there. Um, so I think we know now the kinds of steps we need to take and then through that kind of macroeconomic driver that will create much bigger pressures and um, sort of financing streams and, and financing incentives that will then hugely facilitate the scale up, I think, of things like payment for ecosystem services, you know, natural capital accounting, all of those things will become tools that facilitate that goal. I think we need to get that goal right, though, and, and get it central. And we've got the Environment Bill going through Parliament at the moment. That will hopefully next year get agreed and will start to set in place. Now that has a nature positive sort of underlying um, sort of concept. So I think that will help us to start that process in the UK of working out how do we actually get there and what kind of economic tools will enable us to do that. So I think we're, we're, we're progressing. Thanks very much. Roger, Roger you talked about experiences in the highlands with incentives changing from to add anything on, on there with those market mechanisms yeah i mean market mechanisms are going to work to a degree but what i wanted to say was how do you get at uh, the investor a different way you know lots of times we you talk about one talks about reputational value i've heard that in in charity boardrooms till I'm sick of hearing it. Uh, but 
we've not mentioned the public, the consumer in all of this and the role that they have or one hope that they might have. Um, and I'm not just talking about the, the highly radical groups, I'm talking about the way that uh, people behave on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, how they can begin to influence uh, the big corporates. You know, are they really influencing Unilever, one of the greatest food uh, retailing companies in, in Britain, for instance? Um, and also looking at it the other end, at the producer end, if you talk to farmers, um, they get, I mean, we've all heard how farmers in the, in the UK are very worried about the Australia and now the New Zealand trade deals uh, because uh, it's not a level playing field in terms of the management of the natural resource on which these are based. But I've often heard much to my surprise, um, you know, the exploiters, the last exploiters, the fishermen saying, actually, we've totally changed our approach because we now realize it's not, it's our fault in the way that we have been uh, taking too many fish or we have been damaging uh, the spawning ground so that the biomass is not reproducing at the right rate. And, if you take those sorts of producers right at the coal face and the, the public as the consumers who have a lot of influence and can make a lot of noise, I think they are other mechanisms. We haven't got an easy handle on them, of course. Um, uh, I remember when we did a deal with Safeways many decades ago uh, to sell venison in the supermarkets. And it's that long ago, it was Safeway still. Uh, it lasted six months because people had the wrong perception about this um, herbivore and the type of meat it produced and all the rest of it. So there's that. Two other quick points I want to make. On, on, the, on the stick side, um, we've got these balancing duties in most acts now. There's the biodiversity balancing duty, which, to be perfectly honest, is not worth the paper it's written on because once you have taken it into account, you can say, well, I've taken it into account, we just carry on as before. And that's, I mean, I remember being told by parliamentary draftsmen, uh, that's, the, that's a perfectly le legal and legitimate way of looking at it. So we've got, we've got to think about not just a simple uh, uh, duty, we, we've got to think of other ways of developing the, the sticks. And finally, and this might annoy Karen, you know, people, I'm fed up of the word sustainability now. Um, I remember managing, I'm sorry to keep going back, because, but I'm an old guy now. Uh, um, in 1991, we wanted to put a sustainability, a sustainability duty into the Natural Heritage Scotland bill. And I remember, uh, the, the minister in the House of Lords who was introducing the bill said, what the heck's that, Roger? And I said, well, Tom, you're a farmer. Do you not understand what your basic natural capital is? And he got it straight off. Um, but, you know, this whole concept of sustainability has been hijacked. Sustainable tourism, sustainable economy. I don't know what that means. It isn't the economics a means to the end of sustaining people and their natural environment in which they, they work? And I wonder if we should be uh, changing the way we argue that point. I know that's not what you asked, but I just wanted to get that thing in there because I think, I think it, it, it's important that we feel, how do we promote our message? What, what takes do we put on it? Thanks, Roger. Karen, just quickly on that point, do you have a view on the way the word sustainable is used at the moment? I mean, yeah, I agree. It's, it's kind of lost its meaning in many ways. And I think we have moved on from it uh, because the, the framing I just was talking about, the sort of nature positive framing is considerably more ambitious, actually. So sustainable was just kind of, you know, keep going in a way that doesn't necessarily undermine future uh, <clears throat> environment or future economic prospects, however you want to define sustainable. Whereas now we're actually saying, well, you've already done, you've already ruined that, you've failed on that. Now we've actually got to restore in order to get back to 
where we were optimally placed, which was having a lot more nature than we have now. Uh, and I mean, optimally for society, for the economy. So we've got to restore for our own economic sake. And uh, so we need a nature positive economy. Yeah, so we kind of moved on from sustainable economy to nature positive, which is doing even more ambitious things to get back to, to a bigger uh, set of natural capital, basically, to underpin our future prosperity and wealth. That's great, thanks. I'm sticking on, so I'll, I'll push on to the next question. Um, Karen, you talked about uh, the sort of big picture and having a goal to aim for and moving in that direction. Um, I suppose I'm curious as to what that goal looks like. If we're, if we're agreed that we need to move away from, from or GDP or not, or not have GDP as the only measure, um, economic growth perhaps is unhelpful in, in looking at all of those things. We've already talked about degrowth. I was going to mention that as a, as a potential. You've, you've already sort of said that that's not going to go down very well. Um, donut economics, Kate Rayworth is another one. What, what are we aiming at? What's the sort of, what does an economy with nature embedded in it or, or an environment, natural environment with the economy embedded in it? If you look at the other way around, what does that look like? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. Um, and I mentioned the sort of parallel between nature positive and net zero a minute ago, but net zero is much simpler actually, because it's about carbon emissions. You know, you can measure net zero carbon emissions. Nature positive takes more defining because there's obviously many different dimensions of nature and how, how positive do we have to get? What does that mean? And different countries probably have different contexts. Well, they do definitely have significantly different contexts. So it isn't straightforward to define. I think we do need to define it better. I think the Environment Bill is trying to define it and uh, that's some steps, you know, it's getting there, but I, I think there's a lot more work still to be done to define it. We need a sort of global understanding of what nature positive needs to look like actually for, for um, the whole planet. And there is a, an effort underway. I think it's the, the Global Commons Alliance and um, science-based targets for nature network are looking at what, how do we avoid breaching planetary boundaries? You know, looking at that global level of the big threats in terms of nature loss and what that means for the future of, of our economy and our society and working out what are the priorities to address? So this is one of those issues about pragmatism. We can't just say we just need more nature everywhere. We need to say, what are the priorities? This is an economist mindset. You know, what do we need to do to get the best rate of return on our investment in nature? I know people won't like that, but that is, and that was sort of recommended by the Natural Capital Committee a while ago, actually, that you should, even in the UK context, you can prioritise which types of nature to invest in. And for example, in the UK coastal, vulnerability is one of the biggest threats to us as a country going forward. So investing in uh, building up our, our coastal resilience um, and also flood management, you know, through um, uh, natural infrastructure as was seen as another one. So, you know, doing that sort of prioritization process on a country by country basis is probably going to be necessary for every country to define what nature positive means for that country. Um, and there are a growing number of tools being produced that help countries to work through those kinds of questions. And then I think it's a case of actually developing a strategy for, you know, servicing those priorities and how is that going to be financed? What kind of policies are needed? Um, how can we mobilize the private sector to deliver on that? You know, is that through natural capital accounting and, and some kind of natural capital tax on the private sector or just resource caps? Or, you know, there's lots of different ways of, of doing that. What's the most effective and efficient way of doing that? And I think we then need that globally as well, because many of the most sort of biodiverse, rich and uh, valuable habitats in the world are in other parts of the world. They're in, you know, the UK has destroyed most of its natural capital, to be honest with you already. There are parts of the world, often the poorest parts of the world, that have huge value of, of natural capital. How do we provide or deliver financing mechanisms that, that take some of the, um, the wealth and the sort of... Um, you know, the, the rich countries and the companies in them have often exploited the natural capital in other parts of the world and made profit from it. How do we take some of that, tax it in some way, and then make sure that's transferred into restoring or protecting those parts of the world for the future benefit of the whole of society? You know, because it's the forest in the Amazon and the Congo that will play a huge role in tackling climate change, for example, which will benefit us all. So it's that need for a sort of international financing, financing mechanism that can facilitate that sort of nature positive vision for parts of the world that otherwise won't be able to afford it by themselves. Thanks very much. Catherine, did you have a view on the, the sort of where we're trying to get to? 
Yeah, just when you mentioned the Amazon, I just thought of peatlands because they're the greatest carbon, terrestrial carbon store in, in the world. And, you know, I, I have to say it because it's always the forests that get mentioned. Uh, so the peatlands play a really important role. Um, but back to the question, uh, it's I think we need lots of different initiatives and uh, new the tools that are out there mobilizing them. Um, so things like the wealth accounting, uh, we talked about that inclusive wealth, you know, all those different uh, approaches. Uh, there's this new innovation which has been proposed, the global ecosystem product uh, used in China, developed uh, through the Natural Capital Project Initiative in Stanford. So things like those, you know, can help to, you know, inform better metrics and indicators than this GDP, which really needs to be just sort of shunted uh, away as far as possible. Um, in Ireland, you know, 70% of our land is involved in agriculture. So really there it's about mobilizing these resource-based payment schemes. And just this last weekend, uh, there's a fantastic initiative called the Burn Winterage Scheme where the, the different, you know, farming with nature groups get together. And, you know, they're, they're just excellent because they, they know how to farm with nature, all these things that we're talking about here. And yet I often feel it's, it's just shunted to the side as a nice to have while the dairy herd is escalating and growing at a sort of exponential rate. So there's, 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 we need to approach the farming uh, piece in Ireland um, to get that uh, more balanced. Um, nature positive is a really interesting expression and you know I think that's a place where ecologists are really required because you talked about you know different baselines and different starting points and you know as a restoration ecologist everything needs restoring but where do we start and where do where do we get the best return and I'm I'm quite comfortable with using that expression because if we need to we need to set the priorities that we have where we want to reach and then we need to assess well what can I get for this uh, 100,000 euro that I've got in my bag for, for restoring or this 10 million fund or this 20 whatever amount of money it is how can I get the best return whether it's in terms of the habitat quality so is that what I want or is it the services that can be returned so I could take a really degraded site but I might get a better return uh, in terms of reducing negative flows and improving you know, the overall health and condition to deliver rather than taking something that's almost pristine that might need even more refinement and work. So there's big questions there. So we need to, we need to be able to inform where we start with the restoration and what we can get uh, in terms of return. And that really needs the ecological community. And one of the things that we've been developing is the use of a risk register to highlight the risk in terms of the stocks of nature that you have, but also the flows so that we need to be able to say, well, God, do I want this pristine habitat quality this year or do I want this reversal of negative flows? So those are the sorts of questions that we need to be um, getting to and you know I think I let myself down a bit earlier when I sort of mentioned maybe the the next generation will be more radical because really we have to be radical absolutely uh, you know there's there's no time to waste and uh, when you were talking about habitats and restoration every habitat that's listed on the EU habitats directive in this country is in bad condition and since the time of reporting, it's still in bad condition. So for nearly 20 years, we're looking at bad condition. So if, if we could start to integrate mechanisms where the government could say, we are not moving one year further until we, in, we, we make a plan, we have a restoration strategy, and we have short-term, medium, and long-term goals to get all of those habitats back in good condition, because it's almost like they're used to this. It's almost like having degraded stocks is, ah, that's fine. You know, it's not causing any alarm, but if you were to take that nature positive approach, you'd see, well, actually I'm in the nature negative. I'm in the red here. 
And I, I need to get at least to amber in the next five years or, or else I'm not worth it. And that to me is the role of the investor. Roger alluded to, to it uh, in terms of how businesses can get involved and you know buying up lands for carbon farming or carbon offsets or whatever. But that's where they are really necessary because our government certainly doesn't have the money and they're not gonna get it from the EU not in the in the amounts that they need and that's where the businesses can get involved thanks i suppose in the context of the uk and ireland it, it is more about restoration but we need to remember not to lose any of those pristine habitats as well um roger did you want to add anything on this question well i wanted to come in basically on the back of pristine habitats you know uh, the uh, cbd cop is meeting in Kunming right now. Uh, people tend to think there's only one COP. Uh, they haven't a clue that there are uh, three conventions out of Rio. Um, and desertification is uh, and biodiversity are equally important. And I think that's the message we need to be uh, preaching as well, is the interconnectivity and the interdependency of these major issues. Uh, I've been watching with interest to sometimes great annoyance, the debate about half for nature, uh, you know, half of the earth for nature. It's come out of uh, a, a group of colleagues in, in North America, particularly. And it's this concept of protected areas uh, uh, writ large. Uh, I'm not particularly happy about it. I'm not particularly happy about the 30% a deal that is going to be debated in Kunming, uh, because what about the other 70%, I always ask? Uh, uh, do we, do, does that just degrade? Do we not care about it at all? Um, and I'm much more in favor, you know, on the back of the restoration model, we can't just restore necessarily. I, much, I really like the phrase nature-based solutions. Uh, bio and geo mimicry, because uh, they're fundamental. How do we have sufficient scientific understanding and practical knowledge? The scientists and the ecologists and the environmental managers working together to be able to use these uh, solutions. Uh, sometimes we come up with ones that we hadn't a clue because we haven't thought about uh, possible negative and positive circumstances. I can give you an example just across the river from where I am in, in Musselburgh in East Scotland, uh, where a piece of uh, sea had a wall built around it in the 60s to take pulverized fly ash from a coal-fired power station. It's now a high amenity area for, for people. It's been planted with native species. It's also a a, a special protection area under the birds directive and an SSSI, and it's a highly valued area. But nobody had actually thought about all the pluses and minuses, you know, and in a rather naive way. I, I think we should be asking the question, how many pluses can we get out of any deal and any, any new arrangement, um, uh, which means getting all the parties round the table right at the at the outset to debate these and to also debate seriously what are the whole lifetime assessments of, of these so we look in the long term and we look also at the different scales the local through to the global uh, scale and um, we don't just think of the short-term gains and I, and I need also to, to go back to the consumer as well, to what extent when we are thinking about restoration, we're talking, we're building in the uh, independent assessment schemes, the certification schemes, and have we got the right sort of, uh, not enforcement mechanisms, do, do, we, do, do we have open, uh, transparent assessment schemes? so that the kite mark for sustainable timber or, or, or vegetable oils, for instance, people actually can accept that sort of thing. And that's part of the whole. I'm, I'm an idealist in my old age as well. I'd like us to think about the whole world. I, I, I'm a Lovelock 
fan, you see. I believe in the whole of the Gaia, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, everything's connected. And we can't just think about fixing a bit of nature here and there, because we now know more than ever before the interconnections between uh, atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases and the impact on nature through thermal expansion of oceans, sea level rise and all the rest of it. And unless we think of those big scales as well, we have the big scale system thinkers working with economists, uh, you know, the Mark Maslins and all of these people, um, there are a lot of them around globally now, some wonderful minds. Uh, we don't, we, we're not going to uh, have that level of thinking at, that's at the same level and scale as the economists. Thanks, Roger. I, I absolutely agree as well, going back to your earlier point about uh, COP15 has been forgotten a little bit and um, we need to link the two of them between, yeah, COP15 and COP26. Um, we're, we're swiftly running out of time. It's been a hugely interesting conversation and, and I'm sure we could carry on, but we're going to have to jump ahead to our last question. Um, and that's just, how can we get ecologists, nature conservationists, environmental managers more involved in these kinds of conversations? Um, Catherine, should we come back to you first? I think to to get involved in, in the discussions, just, just put yourself out there. And, you know, in my own perspective, how I became part of this conversation was, you know, working within a company and working with companies, working with uh, people who weren't viewed as, you know, ecologically friendly and who might be viewed, I might then be viewed uh, with a bit of suspicion by associating with these people. So we have to step out of our comfort zone. We can't just talk to each other. We have to step out and we have to engage with those who, who don't understand what we understand but to learn from them, to develop this common language. And I think what was interesting about the Descoptor review, uh, and I have to say, I read every word of it. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. It was, it, while he wrote it primarily for economists to convey the, you know, the intricacies of nature and the value of nature. You know, he really set out some really strong links with society and the need for societal behaviors and all those things that Roger keeps coming back to is the choice of the consumer. So it's about, you know, engaging with, you know, those groups like economists and and, and like her, and she's lovely. I mean, I've quite happily talked to her and worked with her on this issue and find a way forward. And equally then to talk to the politicians and statisticians, but it probably needs to be identify, you know, your own opportunities. Um, but as Descopta said, we need training programs for, you know, everyone. Uh, all modules that are delivered in all walks of life should have, you know, a, a component on nature because it on we cannot get to a world where people realize that society and economy are embedded in nature unless that message is delivered throughout their learning career. You cannot live without this. So therefore keep this in mind through every walk of life. And um, the other piece would be engagement with local communities and the, the role of local communities in terms of what they, they bring. So they bring energy, enthusiasm, and when they decide that they love a habitat or want to restore it or want to bring it back to life or have some positive management, you know, don't get in their way because they find the way and they really, so those are the grassroots things, you know, the things that can really make a difference on the ground. And, you know, while Roger reminded us about the global perspective, you know, I often think back to that, um, you know, act locally, you know, think globally. It's so true. It's, it's how we live our lives that, you know, really leave the imprint, uh, whether it's um, the people we meet and engage with, you know, the lessons we convey. And I'll stop talking because I realize it's one o'clock. So I could go on for hours. Thanks a million. 
That's great, thanks. Uh, Karen, apart from a PR campaign for economists that you might need to run, um, <laughs> how would, how should ecologists, nature conservationists, environmental managers engage? Well, I think it's, it's a really crucial moment and the next year or two will be, uh, it, I think this whole issue about how you create a nature positive economy is gonna be booming and people are gonna be asking, how the hell do we do that? And we, we do definitely need ecologists and environmental uh, um, experts of all types to help answer that question. It's quite unusual having finance ministries who are probably gonna have to get to grips with this and lead it, to be honest with you, if we really want it to be embedded in the way the economy works, but they don't know how to do this stuff. They don't know about nature. So it is a real learning experience on their part. So they're asking for help. They ask us at WWF regularly, you know, what does this mean in practice? How do we operationalize this? So get involved in that. It may be uncomfortable and there's like always difference in approach, but you know, there's immediate opportunities. There's a task force for nature related financial disclosures, which is looking at what the financial sector can start to do to report nature related risks. So that's one thing to potentially get involved with. There's the environment bill. You know, there's going to be a whole series probably of policy actions that are going to be about the finance sector and the economy that it would be great for ecologists and others to get involved in influencing and maybe in collaboration with others who are working in that sort of economic space to sort of work out how to package that up in a, in a really powerful way. The other thing I would say is uh, communicate about the benefits of nature to people as well as just biodiversity. Like what does it mean for families in terms of their health, you know, and their mental health and, and their protection from floods and droughts and, and all of that. It's that sort of natural capital storyline about why it benefits people to have nature all around us. In terms of food supply, you know, all of these things are going to, become ever more visible to people that they are losing out personally from the loss of nature. So I think that's the other way to get a much more, much broader section of society involved and interested in this agenda and, and supporting it politically, which is what we absolutely need if we want government to show to show real leadership. Absolutely, yeah. thanks. Uh, Roger, last word and then we'll wrap up. Well, I want to start with uh, schools education. I mean, I, I think quite a lot happens in primary school. My grandchildren tell me that. Uh, and it's quite integrated approaches. I can have a debate with my 10 year old granddaughter about the tropical rainforest. And I'm very pleased as to how well informed she is uh, about it. But once we get to secondary, it, it goes into silos, you know. And, and I'm a geographer and I've been associated with the geography teachers for years. But you know, we're teaching geography and we're teaching biology. I think we need to think much more about a radical curricular change uh, so that we're educating uh, in the round without barriers of knowledge areas uh, in the secondary school curriculum. And that will then begin to influence further what's happening in the tertiary sector education. Although I think there's a lot more interdisciplinary teaching at the tertiary level than, than before. Uh, second, I'd like to see, and I speak as a former civil servant, and I was in the research class in, 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 in uh, government. We've just set up geographers in government, and that's been very influential. I think uh, uh, Saeem should be thinking about ecologists and environmental managers in government as well. Embed them right in the system, and that's not pushing out the important role that NGOs do. But it's perfectly clear to me, if you're sitting in there rubbing alongside the, the policymakers and their other specialist advisors like economists and statisticians, there's a much greater uh, possibility of influencing the situ situation. Uh, I'd also like to see uh, the infrastructure development companies and the engineering companies employing and recognizing the importance of employing a lot more ecologists and environmental managers. I'm just having a run in about the Musselburgh flood protection scheme because the engineers don't understand natural catchment management, even though it's in a piece of legislation 12 years old here. And finally, because I saw that Sally's listen listening in, um, is there something we should be doing, you, uh, Sally and Jason? In practice is very important uh, because we're a chartered institute improving our standards. What should we be doing within the institute? I don't have an answer to this, but it's a question that I like to debate amongst the fellows perhaps uh, and the wider membership. 
uh, as to how we can do more uh, outreach. We've done extremely well in recent times in connecting with the uh, other chartered institutes, other professional bodies and with, with like-minded NGOs. But what can we be doing in terms of educating the broader public in, in the sorts of things that we've been talking about this morning? Thanks very much, Roger. For those who don't know, Sally is Slime's chief exec and in practice is our institute magazine. So there's food for thought for us to take away there. Um, so we have overrun slightly, but I think this has been a hugely fascinating discussion. So um, apologies for the time, but I think it's been worth it. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. You guys have been brilliant. Uh, this has been a, a really um, in, enlightening conversation. So I hope the uh, listeners have found it interesting as well. So thank you very much to you. Thank you very much to everyone who has tuned in. Uh, as I said, this will go on our YouTube uh, channel and on our resource hub. So thank you very much to everyone and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.